Coming today to the Feast of St. John of Matha. And to be here in the middle of Wisconsin in the frozen tundra. And just a few considerations here in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost to men. St. John of Matha was a great founder around the year 1200. And he is, a, he is a, one of the great saints of the peak of the Catholic Church in its glory. We say that the Catholic Church, we point the year of the greatest glory of the Catholic Church to the year 1215. Remember that the church was, was growing in the time of, there was a time of persecution of the church, in the time of the martyrs, which takes us up to 313, with, with the Battle of uh, Milvian Bridge in 312, and then the Constantine made the Edict of Milan in 313. Then you have the age of the doctors, the great teachers of the church. And that went on until about the year 600 or so. And then the church began to spread it to spread throughout all of Europe. And it began to grow and become strong. And at the peak of the strength of the church in the height of the Middle Ages, we put it on the year 1215. And St. John Amatha was alive at that time. And he typifies the greatness of the church. Remember, in all stages of the world, including the time of the Middle Ages, which is the most glorious time of the church, at all stages of the world, there's always evil. And there's always wicked men doing wicked things and trying to persecute the just. In fact, it's so universal that we have in the ceremony of confirmation, when a young boy or young girl comes to be confirmed, the bishop puts oil on the head and imposes the hands on the head. So he puts oil on the head. I confirm, O Tay, I confirm you with the chrism of salvation. But then what does he do? He slaps the cheek. And why did he slap the cheek? Because if you are strengthened with the chrism of salvation, and if you hold the true faith in your heart, and you really live it in your body, in your flesh, in your life, you will be slapped. And if you don't, you may not be slapped. But if you do, you will be slapped. And so the bishop, he makes a sign of the cross in the forehead with the oil, and then a little slap. And we have seen this order that St. John and Martha created. And then he makes a sign of the cross, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, over the man that is a girl that has just been strengthened in the Holy Ghost. And what did St. John and Martha do? He was inspired by heaven to form a, a, an order for the redemption of captives, and it's called the Order of the Blessed Trinity. The Order of the Blessed Trinity for the redemption of captives, because there, what did he notice at that time? What is in the heart of the Catholic Church? Whenever there's trouble, whenever there's sorrow, whenever there's misery, and at all times there's going to be trouble, sorrow, and misery, the Catholic heart does what? It goes after the one in trouble. It goes after the one in the sorrow. It goes after the misery and tries to help them. And this is what the Blessed Trinity did. Remember, our, how, do we, how do you learn the Blessed Trinity as a little child? How do I know the Blessed Trinity? Well, because my mommy took my hand and said, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. And what is the Trinity associated with? The sign of the cross. How do I know the Trinity? How do I know the inside of God? I know the outside of God because I see the beautiful world that He made. God made such beautiful trees. He made such beautiful, beautiful sun and stars. He made a beautiful earth. All things he made are good. But how do I see inside of God? How do I see inside? This requires a cross. The beautiful element about the cross, the beautiful thing about the cross, is the cross opens the heart. The cross opens the soul. Maybe you should just check out. Right? The cross opens a heart. Oh, that's our bus. That's the seminary. Yeah, you just have them later. Just go take them. Right? The cross opens the heart. The cross opens a soul. And when you open the heart of God, what do you see? Divine love. So much so that the greatest one, what did the greatest apostle do? Who, put, who loved Jesus Christ more than the others, and who was loved more by Jesus Christ than the others, his name is called St. John. What did he do at the Last Supper? He put his head on the heart of Christ. He put his head on the heart. And there he got inside of Jesus Christ. He got inside of God. And so what? how do we know the Blessed Trinity in the real world? The Father sent his only begotten Son for those that abandoned him and hated him, that he might 
give his life for the salvation of the world and buy back. Redeem means to buy back. To buy back souls and bring them to heaven. And then, what did Jesus Christ do before he died? He said to his apostles, it is necessary for you that I go. Because if I don't go, if I don't go, then, then they will not, the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, which means the comforter, he cannot come. So the Father is the one who loves the world, those that turned against him. The Son is the one who died for those that hate God. And the Holy Ghost is the one that comforts those that are attacked and those that are in sorrow because of the sin of man. How do we know inside of God? So St. John Amatha, when he decided to form his order called the Redemption of Captains, he called it the Order of the Blessed Trinity. Because what does the Blessed Trinity do in this world? The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost look for the sick, sick. Look for the weak, look for those that are struggling, look for those that are in sorrow, and reaches into them with their divine love. St. Thomas Aquinas says that there are two acts of divine love. Two acts of divine mercy. The first one is that God looked out of his most wonderful self, and he saw nothing. He saw the emptiness of nothing, and the nothingness of nothing, and then he poured his divine love into it, over six days. And he poured his divine love into nothing. And what happened? From nothing came light. From nothing came a void earth. From nothing came dry land. From nothing came the beautiful stars in the heavens. Came the trees and the animals. And last of all, came the most beautiful creation that he made like unto him, his own image and likeness, which is called man. God saw nothing and he made beauty out of it. But then there came something worse than nothing. There's nothing, there's just nothing. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just nothing. But a man decided to make something worse than nothing, which is called sin. And then what did God do? He poured his love into sin. And he poured it more powerfully into sin than he did into nothing. And he made something more wonderful and more beautiful. And that's what God does when he sees this evil of sin and sorrow. He pours his self into it. St. John recognized, St. John of Martha, that there are souls in Africa captured by the Saracens and they are forgotten because we've got our nice cathedrals in Europe. We got our nice churches. We got monasteries. We got all kinds of places all around us. We got everything we need. And so some guys got captured by the Saracens. Some guys got captured by the Muslims. Some guys are in, in jail and in prison and left there to rot until they die. Too bad for them. But St. John was inspired by the Blessed Trinity. I'm not going to stay in this beautiful cathedral in Europe. I'm not going to stay in this beautiful, these beautiful monasteries. My heart must go to those that are captured, those that are imprisoned, those that are in the greatest sorrow, those that are abandoned. And he formed an order specifically for the redemption of captives. And they took a final vow. There's a three vows that all monks take, poverty, chastity, and obedience. But he added the vow that they would sell themselves be sold as slaves in order to save those that are captured. They would do whatever is required to bring those captured souls back home. And so they did. This is what happens when a Catholic heart filled with the Blessed Trinity looks at the world around us. And right now we need a new order of the redemption of captives. We need one right now. Now there are captives everywhere. You know what they've done right now with this satanic pandemic and this fake pandemic that's going around they've made laws and by these laws that they're in the process of making throughout the whole world everyone is a captive and everyone is entrapped entrapped in their prisons and they're in solitary confinement man told me just last week a good catholic man but he was he was so sick and he was so exhausted and, and so trapped and thought he would never be able to get out of the hospital. I only anointed him just a few weeks ago. Was able to get past the, all those police and was able to anoint him. He said he was just out of, we had reached the hospital very recently. He said he was so discouraged and so sick, but maybe discouraged that he would never see his wife again. He'd never be allowed to see a priest again. That he'd be completely isolated in the hospital and he was considering committing suicide. <laughs> He would never do it, but he was so sorrowful, 
and so sad. And you know, there are millions of souls throughout the world like that all over the place. They are abandoned and they are alone. What is the most serious punishment that can be given to a prisoner in prison? It's not receiving the 39 lashes. It's called solitary confinement. You know when that's the worst punishment you can do to man? Because man is a social animal. We are designed to see each other face to face. And we are designed to see God face to face. And what is the worst punishment in hell? It is called isolation. That's the worst punishment in hell. The fire, in fact, is a distraction from the worst punishment. It is a relief from the worst punishment because if the souls in hell only had the absence of God, and they only could experience the pain of the loss of being completely and infinitely and always alone, they would have an unbearable agony in hell. But God gave them fire, and he gave them other punishments for their sins as a kind of merciful distraction from the greatest pain of hell. But here on earth, there are many souls that are preparing for hell, and they're preparing for it by being completely alone. We need, in our times, an order of sisters. We need an order of sisters that are going to go out to those lonely souls. They are trapped in their houses. They are locked alone. They are being starved to death. They are being told their families can't come and visit them. They are being fed these wicked vaccines that are causing them to be sick and to die. And when they are not fed these things, what if they survive the vaccine? Then what? It says in the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 2, 24, Melior est mors quam vita amara. It is better, death is better than a bitter life. What's the point in being alive for a couple more years just to breathe in prison? We are meant to know, love, and serve God. We're meant to be with our fellow men. We're meant to be connected with our families and connected with the church and connected with God. And so many souls are being isolated, isolated, isolated. And we need a new order of St. John and Martha in our times to go out and visit them. They don't need medication. I remember one time a little a girl, a mother, she was all very depressed and she was struggling very much. And a little seven-year-old girl, her seven-year-old daughter, says, Mommy, you don't need medication. You don't need pills. You don't need drink. You just need love. And she was right. That's what Mommy needed. She didn't need the pills. She didn't need the medications. She didn't need the alcohol. She just needed love. But human beings need human love. There needs to be a connection of man to man, of human beings to human beings. And they're being isolated, isolated, isolated. We need an order of sisters that are going to go out and go to those souls that are isolated and bring them the comfort of the gospel, bring them the healing. You know what you need? You need a good confession. Now, I'm going to bring Father here tomorrow, and you're going to be able to be absolved. You need to be sorry for those abortions you had when you were younger. You need to be sorry for all those terrible things that you did. And you need to come back to God. And you can still come back to God. And you can still be repentant. And you can still have a happy death. And when you have a happy death, you will be forever with the brethren and the sisters of the saints looking at God face to face. You'll never, ever be alone again. You'll never be forgotten. Right now, there are many, many, many forgotten souls all over the world. And we need a new St. John of Mata, And we need a new order of the redemption of captives. And we need to go out and to seek these souls that are lost, these souls that are abandoned, and bring them back to Christ. That's what's needed. But it requires generous souls. Souls want to give themselves, to pour themselves out. As the machine used to say, if the cloud doesn't pour itself out, there'll be no growing fields. It pours itself out, and then there are flowers. We must pour ourselves out. And when we pour ourselves out, beautiful things happen. Good is spread, and God's grace has increased everywhere. So we pray for the increase of the order of St. John of Matha and his spirit in our times. And that when, how do we bring back the glory of Christianity? The Blessed Virgin Mary is going to bring back the whole victory of Christ. She's going to bring back the victory of Christ against Satan. She's going to crush the head of Satan. She's going to inspire our wicked Pope. If not him, the next one that comes after. 
to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to obey heaven. There shall be a conversion of Russia, and there shall be souls coming back to God, and they shall need to be visited, and they shall need to be catechized, and they shall need to be helped, and they shall need to be comforted, and hence we need an order of sisters to give themselves to God, leave behind uh, foolish things of this world. One of, the, one of the foolish things in the world God made is man. St. Augustine used to say, why marry a man who will grow old and leave you a widow? But if you marry Christ, you go into the convent, he'll never grow old, he'll never be a widow, he'll never treat you badly, he will always love and cherish you. It's a wonderful marriage. You know why sisters wear their habit all the time? Because the real life about marriage is, in this world, you get married, you put on your wedding dress. Then there's a thing called the honeymoon. That's when it all begins to go downhill. It's called the honeymoon. And then after that, you got to deal with this loser until he dies. And then you have a little bit of vacation, and then you die. Because the husband has to always die first. And the wife gets a brief vacation period. And then she goes and dies. But the wedding dress is worn only for a day. But when you become a sister to nun, you put on a wedding dress, and it's never removed. That wedding veil is never removed. That wedding dress is never removed. And the joy of that day is only increased as the years go by. And you'll never, ever get past the childbearing years, because you can always be a mother. When you're 162 years old, you've been a nun for 158 to 45 years. You can still have children, and you're still mother, and you're still sister, and you're still young, related to a young spouse. And we have a great shortage of sisters in the world today, a great shortage of vocations, and we need more vocations. We need more souls to give themselves to Christ, to have a little generosity, to pour themselves out for the good of others in imitation of the spirit of the Holy Trinity. The Father that so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son to die. The Son that so loved us, that he gave his life for our salvation, and said he must go, that he might send the paraclete who is our consoler and inside of us. And let the Spirit of the Blessed Trinity enter us. And remember, we can never know the beauty of that Trinity unless we pass from the Father to the Son and the Holy Ghost. We have to pass through the cross. And when we pass through the cross, there are so many beautiful things to see on the other side. That's the pathway to heaven, the pathway to happiness, the pathway to the increase of love in our modern world, which knows not love. Lord, bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.